Um, we'll talk about tigers, I guess. I don't know. We'll try <laughs> to figure that out. Um, you know, um, not the Detroit Tigers. Yeah. Yeah. As long as we don't talk about the Lions, that's it. <laughs> that's, yeah. We'll have lots to discuss here, obviously. Uh, David, thank you. Thanks to the Techonomy team. Thanks to the city of Detroit. Uh, our panel was talking about what a terrific time to be in this city um, for a number of reasons. Uh, we're going to talk about a topic, as David introduced, which has been an important part of Detroit's past. Uh, we're going to talk about it, and it's manufacturing. It's, it's, it'll be an important part of Detroit's future. It'll be an important part of the global economy's future. Uh, when we've looked at uh, manufacturing as part of the McKinsey Global Institute research, globally, it's, it's only about 15% only about of the global economy if you look at a GDP uh, standpoint, if you look at it from an employment standpoint. But it has an outsized amount of impact uh, on things like exports, r you know, roughly 70% of exports. Roughly almost 80% of the world's R&D is associated with manufacturing. Um, and an increasing amount of the productivity growth also is related to manufacturing. So it has huge economic potential. Um, and then, you know, as, as we even did research on Internet of Things, you know, as much as people talk about, you know, wearables and smart home, et cetera, we found twice as much potential impact in B2B situations. And the setting in which Internet of, Internet of Things had the most impact was actually the factory setting. So this is a, a, a clearly just not a, a, a topic for the, for the history books, but really a topic for the, for the future. So I wanna, want to uh, allow each of uh, our ter terrific panel to introduce themselves briefly with a, a name and, and what you're doing now. So uh, Mike, go ahead. Sure, I'm Mike Whitens from Ford. I'm our Director of Vehicle and Enterprise Science. Uh, Mark Hatch, I'm the CEO of uh, TechShop. Jerry Foster, I'm the CTO of Plex Systems. And I'm Raj Bhatt from the president of Digital Factory for Siemens Corporation. Terrific. Well, why, why don't we, you know, when, when we talked with each of you uh, before this uh, panel, uh, what was interesting, I think, is each of you sort of wanted to talk about the, the historical arc of how things have gone, uh, how things have happened in manufacturing previously. So, Jerry, why don't we start with you? Um, you know, when did you start? What, what did you start with? You, you had an interesting story about RS-232 cables in factories, for instance. Well, we talk about the Internet of Things often like it's this new thing, trying to connect things. But if you're a manufacturer, you know that you've been connecting things as long as you can remember. And I got my start at a, as a programmer in a forging company just up the road in Oxford, Michigan. And uh, one of the things that we did was uh, we would connect our CNC lathes to the central computer. And I had to string this RS-232 cable through the ceiling to connect the lathes to the central computer. And that allowed us to automate uploading recipes as opposed to the operator having to type in these recipes by hand, which is a very laborious process. So we would automate that. And the, um, so I had to stretch this uh, cable through the ceiling and down to the floor. And I remember I would get home and, and my wife would see all the grease and the oil and the graphite. And she, I thought you were a programmer. I'm like, I am. So uh, a great time doing that. And, and connectivity has been part of manufacturing. Uh, it's part of our DNA, connecting things, connecting machines and, and automating and, and getting the efficiencies and cutting down, uh, reducing costs uh, as a result. So number one, what's a CNC machine? Uh, it, it does uh, lathe work, it cuts, uh, it cuts uh, material uh, to a sp uh, specification. And number two, what's different now? No, you know, I don't see any graphite on your hands right now. <laughs> what's different in the industry or with, with me? <laughs> Both. <laughs> so, um, what's different? Um, I think um, we've just taken that connectivity and extrapolated it, and it's now kind of a, on a hockey stick. And so everything is com coming connected. Uh, back then, everything had the RS-232 port, and now everything's got a USB port or is um, API enabled. And so just about anything can be connected um, with, the, uh, with the cloud and through the internet. And so we're, we're seeing that uh, uh, expand considerably. And the, the possibilities are endless. And so we are providing a platform so that when our customers come to it, because we can't envision all of the things that people are going to want to connect. I mean, new things are happening every, every day, every week. So we're trying to build platforms for ERP and for manufacturing systems that anybody can come to us and say, we want to connect this machine. We want to connect this tool. We want to connect these Google Glass. We want to connect this. To, to the shop floor, and we can do that and provide that. So what is cloud other than something we're not seeing outside today, and what does it mean for manufacturing? Because you know people think of cloud as being you know, some highfalutin, high-tech thing. Right, so what is cloud? Um, for us, it's just a platform for delivering for innovation. Um, people talk about cloud, I gotta get to the cloud. Um, for us, we, we, at Plex Systems, we make manufacturing software. We have a happy ERP customers, actually. And, um, but for us, being able to deliver that innovation is possible through the cloud. The cloud provides a platform for, for our customers to experience that innovation because they don't have to set up the infrastructure beforehand to make that happen. We provide that. We provide the infrastructure and so that we go to a customer and we say, we have this new thing that we want to implement uh, on the shop floor and, or they come to us and say, we, we have some ideas here and we can, we can provide that without um, 
a lot of setup or infrastructure cost on their side, and the cloud enables that. It's a delivery mechanism for us to deliver that um, implementation and that innovation uh, real time. So this sounds like an awesome future, right? We just plug everything in that can be possibly connected. But let me turn to Raj for a second. You know, we talked about an incredible future in, of, of manufacturing, but you have also said, look, let's be realistic about where we are, particularly here in this country, uh, with regard to the infrastructure we have in place. Can you talk a little more about where we are today and, and, and the challenges we'll have to overcome? Well, you know, look, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've walked through thousands of, thousands of factories in the States, and, and this is not just any one particular industry, but we talk about really an aging infrastructure here in the United States. You know, you talk about stats that'll tell you that, and this is even with big progressive companies, stats that'll tell you that we have the oldest aging automation. You're not talking about us, right? Uh, well, no, I hope not. <laughs> okay. but, uh, you know, but you know, we have the oldest aging automation infrastructure since 38. You know, that means that it's not necessarily from 1938, but it's the oldest since 1938. And I would argue that if you go into some factories, it probably is from 1938. Um, so really old, really outdated, you simply can't get productivity with a 286 computer. And that's what it's, what it's, what it's akin to. And think about this, I mean, if you, you, know, if you think about uh, what Jerry was talking about, RS-232, think about how much patience we what have. What is that? What is RS-232? It's a, it's a serial bus and a serial way to, way to communicate, but I mean, it's, but I mean, just, just think about how much patience we had to deal with those communication networks before. You wouldn't even think about that today. So, so I would argue that, uh, that you know, we have to really address the aging infrastructure base. And, and so you know, I, I would just make the statement that when it's not in vogue to have your iPhone for, for more than six months, why is it okay to have an automation asset on the factory floor that's 40 years old? You know, that's at really at the end of its useful life. So you know, somehow the manufacturing industry hasn't caught up to what we see in consumer electronics in the consumer industry. I mean, it's getting there, but uh, you know, there's still a long way to go. So why not? Well, I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I personally have some, have some views on this, and I would say that, uh, um, you know, somewhere it wasn't strategic to the enterprise anymore. You know, we put a lot of CFOs on top of corporations. And, you know, of course, Henry Ford wouldn't be happy about this because he started the Industrial Revolution 100 years ago, and so he, you know, we were the, sort of the icon of the world when we produced the Model T. But, uh, you know, I mean, somewhere in the process, um, you know, it was in vogue to outsource manufacturing. It was in vogue to get it off U.S. shores. Um, and, you know, we simply can't make high technology, high value goods and innovate in environments where you don't have manufacturing present. I mean, you have to have those two co-located. Exactly. Not only that, the, 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 the auto industry particularly has been, been, been tightening the screws on, on the suppliers to drive out costs, to drive down costs. And, and to eliminate that cost. And so if you're a, 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 a small manufacturer and you, you're looking at your infrastructure and you're like, I can patch this for this amount or I can buy a new press for you know, this, this many millions of dollars, you're gonna try to eke that out as long as you can and that's caught up to us now. So Raj, what, what, what does this mean? What's the future if this is the challenge? Well, well you know, look, I mean, I, you know, I, I think today manufacturing is becoming much more strategic to the enterprise. So companies realize that that it's a creator of jobs, it's important to corporations, you know, and we're using this now as a competitive weapon versus a necessary evil. You know, so before people had spreadsheets and said, how many low cost countries can I manufacture in? And if you don't have the chart that said, you know, you were in X percentage of low cost countries, you know, you really didn't pass the litmus test of, of, of being a good executive or being a good CEO. And, and I think today, um, we certainly won't be the, the country that manufactures cotton shirts and produces cotton shirts. We certainly will be the country that is innovative in design, in digitalization, in uh, simulation. So these are all technologies today that the internet lets us bring to the manufacturing age. You know, the, the internet lets us connect devices. Um, it lets us simulate, and these are big decisive advantages. And I would say the biggest factor that, that uh, manufacturing companies deal with right now is time to market. I mean, how fast can you get to market? It's not about proprietary things, but it's about getting to market quick. I mean, you have auto companies, you have aerospace companies, you have companies that uh, just, you know, simply the first guy out of the gate that gets there gets the business. Because sooner or later, people are going to catch up. So time to market is the decisive advantage. And what is it that's causing this mind ship set shift for manufacturing to be a strategic thing rather than something the CFO should try to be cutting? Well, I, I just think we have this $12 trillion beast called the American consumer. And, and you know, this, this, this consumer you know, needs goods, needs services. You know, the utilization rates at factories are really high today. So even feeding our own domestic demand is, is really impressive. And you know, the guys that are really good at what they do um, you know, will get out to market quicker. Um, you know, we'll have better efficiency. We'll lower their cost to produce products. We'll connect uh, the design of a product to the manufacturability of a product. 
Um, and so, you know, these were sort of looked at in different spaces previously. You know, the design guys work in the design, manufacturing guys work in the manufacturing, and somewhere in the middle you had the demilitarized zone. You know, then you tried to connect the floor to the, to the IT organization. And so, uh, you, you know, I think this is starting to merge. And, uh, um, you know, you can only get increments of productivity to automate a little more. You have to change the, the whole approach and look at this holistically. So Mike, you uh, represent one of the leading manufacturers in this country and the world, to, to be frank. And um, uh, I'd love to get your perspective on how things have changed over your career. Hilariously, I talked to one of your colleagues last night who's a, you know, I think it was a short timer at Ford, only 35 years mm -hmm. or something like that. He remembers when they retired the last, you know, punch card mm -hmm. computer out of one of the plants. So, can you explain, you've, you've talked about an inflection point now that's happening. Yeah. Well, I'm a new entry into Ford. I've been at Ford 28 years, so uh, <laughs> I'm in good shape. So essentially when I started, when we talk about the, the war stories of how we started, we used to assemble when we were designing a vehicle and we'd set up a master layout review. And I don't know if any of you in the audience remember Mylar's. Well, what we used to do if you took a door system is you would overlay the detailed drawings of each of those parts, hundreds of parts that make up a door system, and you'd all look at it to find out if you had clearances and everything was proper. Then you'd invite your manufacturing counterpart over to try to look at it. Imagine trying to figure out something you didn't design, actually give 3D feasibility and hand clearance. It was quite a challenge, and part of the issue with infrastructure is because we had those issues, we drove change downstream, which is huge inefficiency. The way we're set up today, just like Henry Ford did in the past, you saw Elizabeth Barron go through our five process last night, which is our Ford Innovation Lab, Immersion Lab. And essentially what we do is take all of that digital data and be able to look at it in real time and put your headset on and actually give feasibility. And what's really been great within the company, we talk about the partnership with manufacturing and engineering and design, right? Well, his, historically what happens, the designers make a beautiful aesthetic model in the studio and here comes Mike Whiten's engineering walking in and saying, well, wait a minute, it's not feasible and when we get done, it's square and ugly and now it's feasible. And that's how we iterated back and forth. Now we can immerse ourselves in the data with our manufacturing people, with design and with engineering all in the same room digitally and also globally. The efficiency is massive and where it's really most efficient is for our downstream suppliers. Because when you take a look, and we've done studies on tooling, a significant amount of investment in churn in the supply base is managing the late changes that come from us. So if we can leverage the cloud, leverage technology and this data, and eliminate those downstream changes, then our supply base, all the way down through the tiers, can work on efficiency in their facilities prior to job one versus that 90-day launch curve after job one because they've just gotten tools in place in time. So that's the vision that we see and something that we're starting to implement at Ford. And what's, how, why is this possible now? What, what, what are the things that are actually changing? Well, the significant access that we talked about, the cloud, the digital space, the memory and computing space where we can actually put all this data together in one spot and share it simultaneously around the globe. Even five and six years ago, it wasn't possible. The time delays that you would have to try to do it. So technology is changing so fast and we're truly at an inflection point in all areas of the business. So Mark, it's Great fun that you're sitting next to Mike, right? Because if you think about the company that Mike, how many employees at, at the Ford Motor Company? A lot of them. A lot. <laughs> I think it's like 190,000. Yeah, 190,000. Like right? yeah. And then, Mark, you, you run this company that, that allows all kinds of people to, uh, to become manufacturers. Can you talk a little bit about what you do? And then, you know, you know what, what's going on in the tech shops? What, what's the technology now that allows people to do all kinds of things sure. that they haven't been so able to do? For, for those who may not know, tech shop is. Um, uh, eight, we have eight locations across the U.S., including one sponsored by Ford uh, up here in Dearborn. Each one's 20,000 square feet and has every tool you need to make anything on the planet. Machine tools, woodworking, plastic, electronics, textiles, you name it, we've got it. Uh, we also teach classes on how to use it. Um, and this is, uh, you know, this is not your grandfather's industrial revolution. Everything has changed. Uh, these tools are easy to use, incredibly powerful, and actually very cheap. And you combine that with the internet to get access to markets, you combine that with social media to get access to capital through uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and you combine that with the ease of use of which you can actually learn how to use a tool in the next week to produce what it is that you want, 
Everything around innovation, I believe, has fundamentally changed in the last decade. That's a slight overstatement, because you still need Fords and so forth to do three years of research. But we are having people come in and learn how to use a computer numerically controlled tool in a week, and then getting on a machine and making a product that they can imagine, and then getting it drop shipped from somewhere else around the world, ship the designs off, and then and start bringing it in. And we have this inflection point where labor is no longer the arbitrage that it used to be. Energy is cheaper here than anywhere else in the world. And automation is coming to machines that are actually incredibly cheap. And so the, the unit of production needed to have a competitive product that meets a particular consumer's need in a customized way is more attainable today than it has ever been in all of human history. And our platform enables that. Can you talk about, uh, literally, some of the tools that somebody would have access to in, in a tech shop? Yeah, so we have a you, with it. You know, computer numerically controlled um, uh, mill and, and lathe. And you know, they used to be a quarter million dollars, a half a million dollars. Uh, we're getting them drop shipped and installed for 17,000 uh, bucks. Plus, we then resell it for $150 a month. So our members, on average, are saving 97% of their hardware startup costs in a lean way by coming in and leveraging our facility. What that means is the cost of failure is no longer $500,000 or a million, it's a thousand bucks or 5,000 bucks. And when you quote unquote fail for a thousand bucks, I call that cheap learning. It actually costs less than a semester at a local, uh, at a local junior college. And so what type of, you know, Companies are, you know, t talk a little bit about who, who your well, clients yeah, are. Of course, companies. we have lots of startups. Yeah. Um, you know, so Square famously came out of our um, uh, Menlo Park uh, uh, location. So the original design um, for the, th the three prototypes, James McKelvey learned the skills he needed on site in a matter of weeks to be able to build the prototype. So he, he did not know how to use a mill, he did not know how to use a lathe, he had never done injection molding before, he actually wasn't an electronics guy. He picked up all of the skills that he needed, leveraging the community and the online and our classes, and within six weeks had enough skill set to build the original prototypes. And then went into the, sh into the shop and actually built them and then launched the company. What's important here is that they had pitched the venture capital community the idea. Jack Dorsey and James had gone into the, into the valley and had been turned down. Then James came in, learned the skills he needed, built the prototypes, went back to the community, and just asked for 10, 50 bucks off each of them. Actually demonstrated the prototype. And here's the difference. Asking somebody to give you money outside of your domain with a PowerPoint slide, you will fail every time. Asking somebody to give you money when you can demonstrate the physical prototype functioning in their hand, it's very difficult for even an engineer to say, I don't think it's going to work, when it's working in your hand. <laughs> That's like a good insight. Well, 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 you know, Mark, it's what the Shark Tank does. I was just going to say. Yeah. 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 Oh, we've had, we've had a couple of Shark Tank don't work successes. Yeah, the, yeah, we had a couple. Uh, so this is, I carry this one because this is one of the examples, right? So this is a simple iPad case made out of bamboo and book binding. Patrick Buckley came in and asked, what classes do I need to take to learn how to use the tools to manufacture this in, in small quantities. Um, and it was introduction to computer numerically controlled programming. That's a three hour class. Introduction to the machine, that's another three hour class. About 20 hours of using software that's by the way connected to the web so that you can do high quality, very high resolution um, simulation and then bring it down to the computer. 90 days later, he had sold a million dollars in product. He did 10 million, I'm sorry, 4 million in the first year, 10 million in the second, 35 million in the third. He now owns his own manufacturing facility in San Francisco producing these. So we now live in an era where you can pick up the skills that you need to be able to go to market in three months. I, mean, I ran a stage gated new product development process at a large manufacturing company. I couldn't get the decision makers in a room to make a decision to move into the first stage in less than three months. And now we have people that have gone through the entire process, basically for less money than my meetings, and actually launching companies. So every, I mean, everything has fundamentally changed. We have a lot of assumptions that we go into uh, manufacturing now that are simply no longer true. The tools are cheap, they're easy to use, they're incredibly powerful, and they're coming back to the United States. And they're connected. Absolutely. So Jay, I, I'm curious, right? I mean, we, we had a discussion before, and you said, oh, everybody thinks this sexy thing is just like writing some app and you know, getting lots of downloads, right? But you have a view that manufacturing actually might be you know, more exciting than that, right? And I think Mark is illustrating that. It, I, I'd love to get your views on, on where you think, you know. Yeah, you know, we see, I see manufacturing from the technology side, and it's not just technology for technology's sake. We have to deliver value to our customers, uh, especially on the shop floor. And, 
And uh, we do some exciting stuff with technology. We have a wearables program. Um, we're looking at augmented reality. I think Carl from Autodesk earlier had talked about that. Microsoft has a HoloLens product that we are looking at to really deliver some really cool functionality on the shop floor that the workers can use. So there's a lot of exciting things. And, and we heard a, a little bit of, ago about um, this, this, gap, this perception problem with manufacturing and, and the excitement there. And there's so much, as, as Mark said, there's so much cool stuff going on in the manufacturing space. I don't think we've done a good job of communicating that. So when someone says, uh, you know, do you want your little Johnny to grow up to be in, in manufacturing? It's usually no. Um, you know, I'm going to send him to a liberal arts camp and when he's three so he doesn't have to do that. But there's so much cool stuff going on that we see uh, actually enabling the shop floor workers to, to, to wear these cool devices and improve their productivity and do, do fun, cool stuff while they're doing it. But there's a, there's a skill and perception level there that we have to, to continue to work on and, and increase yeah. to make it happen. And Raj, you had already mentioned this fact that this integration of you know, development, research development, manufacturing, maybe even customer support, and, and IT in terms of the CIO role. Yeah. How, how is that going to happen, right? Because if you look at a traditional organization, well, you know, you look, said, these people don't talk yeah, to each other. Yeah, yeah you know, look, and, and I think these, these environments are certainly start, starting to merge. I mean, if you look at, um, I, I, let's just take the advancements that have occurred in the, in the ERP environment, enterprise resource planning, when you see SAP, you see all the big systems. I mean, you just can't, you know, Plex. get, yeah, yeah you just can't get, the, you can't get the five DVDs, you know, for SAP and decide to get, get rolling. You have to do a business process optimization, change your business processes. And fundamentally, when you talk about digitalizing manufacturing environments, and you talk especially about product design, because it's a known quantity that, you know, 80% of manufacturing costs are predetermined in the product design phase. Mm -hmm. So if you don't get the design right, you don't get the manufacturability of that product right. Mm -hmm. and. And you know, these were two very disparate environments before. So I think just by virtue of digitalization, the key there is to have a digital backbone. So you know, people say, well, how do we go about doing it? And I can tell you, first off, it's very scalable. You know, I mean, people think that this is a billion dollar project when you're getting into IoT and you're getting into digitalization and they just, you know, I mean, SAP hits them square in the head. They say, well, you know, I'm a small company, I can never do this. You know, and I think Mark just gave all the great examples of where usability is increasing, the tech savvy of the individual is increasing. Um, and, and, and all these things really make a big, big difference when you talk about moving into the internet age, moving into the, into the, into the digitalized age. And I, again, really believe here that simulation is going to be the decisive advantage. Because if you don't have a manufacturing line, you don't have a physical place to go test it out, I mean, how do you open your laptop up and, and simulate a product, look at how that product runs, you know, look at what improvements you could make in the manufacturing process. You could all do this in a, in a very virtual way. And, and so this technology... So what does that mean, yeah? Well, well, well this technology is bringing those environments together. You just won't survive you know, being isolated in the CIO environment and a manufacturing guy being isolated in the manufacturing environment. I mean, you have to... This has to be an integrated whole. So what's a virtual factory? Well, you, you know, look, I mean, you have a lot of great examples of customers in the... Uh, certainly the auto industry is one of the, just one of the pioneers in it, the aircraft industry. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, they're using advanced simulation technologies to model and, and build vehicles and, you know, figure out if these vehicles, you know, when you look at parts and you look at components, you look at aero structures, um, you know, you look at how do you simulate the manufacturing line itself, you know, to look at robot movements and travel and, you know, it's just, it, it's another increment of efficiency when you're able to simulate. And, and what happens there is you cut the time to market. But to simulate, you have to, dig, you have to digitalize. So you have to have things on a digital backbone, and that's the key. Just like you know, you're moving into a, a, a. I mean, look at the camera environment. You know, once you get everything in pixels and you get it all digitalized, you can do a lot with a photograph. Go ahead. In, a, in, a, in another step, we, we're partnering with uh, Fujitsu on, our, on a range of projects, and so I had an opportunity to, to see their manufacturing line, and they um, they were one of the few companies that explicitly chose not to chase cheap labor uh, into Asia and India, and instead to invest in uh, robotic lines, digitization, and modularization. And so what they've got some, some, I think, some really interesting technology where they've basically said, we're going to Legoize our, our phone manufacturing line. And by Legoizing it, what, what that enables us to do, and I'm using the term that they wouldn't have used, but they, that's how I, I described it. It's like, okay, this one does screws. This one does this form of automation. This one does this. And now I've got a virtual chain where I can say, okay, I need this for, you know, I need this, for this product, and I need this, and I need one of those, and I need one of these, and I need a human here, and here are the instructions they need to do, and here are that. And they can deploy this thing inside of weeks. And they can manufacture things like 10,000 to 15,000 units they can be profitable at. 
That is remarkable. And as you continue, it's like, okay, we're gonna continue to automate that. And they're looking to now, like a lot of folks, like, okay, can we make this regional? Can we make this local? Can we move this modularization concept? Because by the way, these modules are no longer a million dollars each. They're now $50,000, and soon they'll be $10,000. So you'll be able to assemble in almost real time the manufacturing components you need to make a very sophisticated device and be able to produce it in very low volumes. And that is really, and it's all enabled because of the software and digitization and cost. Yep. Yeah. And, it's, and it's coming to the point where machines optimize other machines. And you, you know, we call that concept cyber physical. So cyber physical autonomous production. So if you go in, you know, there are some state of the art manufacturing facilities. I mean, we have you know, 300 plants, almost 300 plants in Siemens. We, we introduce tens of products daily. And I talk, I'm talking innovation wise. Um, and, and we have a factory in, in, in Omberg that produces PLCs, 12 million PLCs a year um, in 12,000 variants, and we have probably 1,000 workers in that factory. Um, we obviously have a lot of high-tech machines there that are very connected, very digitalized on a, on a digital backbone. Uh, and you know, you're talking about a, a factory now that is 75% controlled by robots and machines. And, and, and if we think about defects per million, because that means something, defects per million, you talk about a good employee generating 500 defects per million. And with this factory that was fully digitalized, um, we have 12 defects per million. You talk about a 99 point X percent quality rate. And so you know, it just shows you how powerful it is when you digitalize it. And I got to tell you, and, and what the workers do in that factory is not tell the machines what to do. The machines tell the other machines what to do. And the, and, and the products tell the machines what they want done. Right. So, so this is you know, self-healing systems and cyber-physical systems. And this is sort of the, the, the state of where things are going. And that's what you can really get out of, out of digitalization when you talk about quality rates and time to market and efficiency. Terrific. We're going to come to questions in a moment, so get ready with them. But before then, Mike, I, we've talked a lot about some pretty amazing technology, whether it's you know, less expensive, you know, virtual, mm -hmm. or machines even teaching machines. But, um, you know, in your large organization with a lot of people, uh, you've also talked about the importance of culture and experimentation. Talk, talk a little more about what it takes to make this manufacturing happen with regard to, to people and, and culture. Well, I think culture is one of the most important things, and what's really key is embracing the new technology and being open to it. Part of our mindset at Ford is innovating in every part of the business. And what's really important when you do that is you embrace the digital world. And you also look, when we talk about the virtuous circle, we have to do feasibility upfront digitally so that manufacturing can be more efficient. But we also need from each of the tiers that digital feasibility fed backward so we get the feasibility initially upfront. So both of us together working together. That means our people reaching out to people that they never reached out to in the past. And, and, be, and embracing that, and also embracing way up front in the design process that feasibility from the manufacturing floor, that input that you never got before in your whole career. So it's really changing the culture, and as senior leaders, making sure you embrace the change, allow people to fail quickly, and ask them, what did you learn from the issue, and how can we correct it right now? And that's a big change in how we work, but one of the real critical ones for us to accelerate progress. What's the, what's the, what's the key? What's the hardest thing to do? I mean, change in large organizations is hard, right? Well, I, I think it's not that hard when you're aligned at the leadership level. All of us want to innovate. We want to innovate at, in all areas of the business, and we embrace that and cascade that throughout the organization. I think that's really the key. Terrific. Let's open it up to questions. A anything that people want to ask from the audience here? Do you have a mic or? Yeah. Okay, my name's Drew Kostakis. Uh, disclosure, I work for Microsoft, but I like to uh, work on uh, physical products as well. And Mark, I've, I'm a member of Tech Shop. Oh, uh, thanks awesome. for sponsoring a great deal as a vet as well. I really appreciate yeah. that. But um, one of the questions I have is, uh, I, I see a bit of a gap from this prototyping and, and learning how to build physical objects to connecting that to somebody who can manufacture that for you or somebody that can provide capital or a mentor. And I was just at um, uh, Techstars Mobility last week and they do a great job in the software incubation business of kind of connecting that, that next mile once you've got a good prototype and a good idea to get ideas. And wondering what your thoughts are on that. 
Yeah, it's a great question, um, and it's one of the more difficult uh, problems that we're currently facing, it, at least on the scale on the on the products that require scale. Um, there's a there's a dearth of manufacturers who can manufacture 500 or 1,000 of something and actually make uh, make it work. The good news is that this is a known problem now, and there are a lot of folks working on it. And I've got a couple of examples. So PCH, uh, Liam Casey's uh, company. Now, they do you know, billions of dollars in uh, manufacturing for large electronics companies, and he's now got an accelerator um, in, uh, in San Francisco as well as a, a site in Shenzhen to try to get to, to, get to that solution set. Um, another thing that's interesting, though, is that there, is, there are huge pieces of the economy that don't need scale. You don't need to produce 10 thousand of something or a million of something you know you can get started with a thousand or five thousand or ten thousand and there's a lot of margin and opportunity in those parts of the space it's really when you start thinking okay and I'm gonna do a Kickstarter campaign and this is just like the the bane and excitement of overselling your hardware product like oh my gosh instead of having to produce 60 of these I have to produce 6,000 and I've seen this, like I had the Gantt chart of here's how I'm gonna produce the 60, it's gonna take me six weeks. Then this thing went um, you know, uh, hyper on him and, and he was loath to turn it off and say, no, I, I don't want your orders. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to do. And so he had to figure out a way of uh, making 6,000 of them. He sorted, it, he sorted it out, but it's a very difficult problem. Um, I think we're making some progress. The White House is concerned about it. We're getting interest from folks like Flextronics and, and uh, Fujitsu and and others that are also looking at it, trying to understand what their particular place in the ecosystem is going to be. I think we're gonna get, or get a solution here sooner than we, we may think, actually. Sounds like a business opportunity. A huge, huge business opportunity. Any other questions from the audience? Anything else, people? I know it's right before lunch, so come on. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. Um, just curious how, what you guys think about um, sort of the downfall of Quirky and what that means for this middle ground between inventing something and really bringing a product to market. I love Quirky. Ben is a friend of mine. Um, so it was, I think it was an unfortunate demise. I obviously got way out over the skis. Um, producing, you know, producing a new product every week um, is an interesting mental exercise. Um, and somehow he managed to attract $180 million around that. Um, but you've got to be able to produce a product that consumers actually want. And um, so I, there were parts of it that I really enjoyed. The front end of his process where he, he aggregates both experts and consumers. And then I liked the GE alignment where then they actually informed it with people who had deep expertise in the field. That's what Quirky was lacking. They had like, this democracy of folks that came together and said, yeah, we like that. And then they ended up, most of their products didn't sell. Many of them cost hundreds of thousands of dollars just to develop, and they would sell like five or 10. Um, I think there were some interesting marriages there. The thing that, the particular project I enjoyed the most was the GE um, air conditioner. And the reason is that essentially what happened was uh, GE and Beth Comstock in particular used the front end of the quirky process to cut two years out of their design process. They set the specification in 60 days by leveraging the crowd's information as well as their expertise, that is interesting. They, it, I mean, they took two years out of the development cycle. And then because they had consumer feedback and they actually knew the distribution channels and they knew the stuff that Ben didn't have access to in a lot of the other categories, she was able to commit, they were able to commit, say, we're gonna do this in volume. So rather than doing a test in a market somewhere in Peoria and spend another year trying to figure out whether or not they got the features right, they cut another year out of the process. So she essentially took two and a half to three years out of the process of producing a product, and she did it in like six months, soup to nuts. That is really fascinating. If you're now competing with GE in that particular space, if, if they can figure out how to continue to tap into the expertise of the crowd, marry it with their distribution and understanding of the market, I think you've got an entirely new way of going to market. And it's a different kind of cut on the internet of manufacturing, but it leverages everything about access to social media and capital to be able to really shorten cycle times. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll go to the dangerous lightning round. <clears throat> All right, going lightning round. We're gonna start with you, Mike. Uh, who is the most interesting thinker around the future of manufacturing, present company excluded? The most interesting thinker. Most interesting thinker. 
Oh, that's, that's very interesting. I think present company is, is, is actually very good. I think the thinking around, around manufacturing and when you look at the Internet of Things and how we do it is very, very important. Uh, Carl, Carl Bass. Carl Bass, please. yes, yeah. another Techonomy participant. Um, boy, that's a tough one. I'm not sure. I, I had a mentor, his name was Rob Beattie, who helped start Plex. All right. Incredible thinker on, on what it meant to make manufacturing on the shop floor. Terrific. Right. Us, I'm watching work at the Gigafactory. It's pretty amazing. All right. Uh, what process in the manufacturing value chain is most in need of being digitized and or modernized? Raj. What part of the manufacturing floor is most in need? Um, I would say the process. The, yeah. I would say the production processes, the actual factory, the actual plant floor itself. Yeah, Jerry. I would say uh, connecting all parts of the supply chain. I've got, you see big pockets of connectivity inside, but connecting the whole the whole thing from front to front to end uh, still needs to be worked on. All right. Uh, so there's this middleware piece called CAM, computer-aided manufacturing software. So you've got the design software, which is universal, and you have a, a particular machine. And it turns out, to create the machine code, there are, for us, five different CAM packages that our members may have to learn in order to make it work there. And so it's the biggest conversation I've had with Carl, because <laughs> we need to solve the CAM problem. It needs to be an Adobe Postscript. The, the, this, this design software shouldn't need to be able to understand the final, it should just be able to create a postscript and the machine can read it. And we are nowhere close. Mike. The computer-aided manufacturing of the process tied to the computer-aided feasibility of the components, the molding, mm -hmm. the assembly, the welding, all tied together. Where do you get your best information about the future of manufacturing? Um, we get it from our people and from all of our suppliers in the supply chain. So basically, you get ideas for the future from all the different chains, and the key thing is for us to assemble, connect the dots, and put it all together. Mark. Uh, I get it from panels like this at phenomenal locations like this. Our customers, hardcore, hundreds of hardcore manufacturers, and we, we meet and talk with them regularly, and we, we get great insight into what's going on in their life. Roger. Uh, I, I have to clearly say that, that, that it's absolutely our very diverse slate of customers across industries and our own manufacturing plants. What company other than your own is doing the most innovative things in manufacturing? Raj. Most innovative things. Uh, I would say, um, I, I would probably say BMW. Sure. We have a customer that I can't name. Um, they make diesel engines and they're yellow and they have a three letter name that's not dog. But it's incredible what they're doing at their facility. <laughs> <laughs> Mark. I'm going to go a completely different direction here. Uh, you know, we're in the middle of a revolution, and in revolutions you have arms suppliers, and I'd say Haas out of Oxnard, which is producing just stunning amounts of CNC machines. It's probably one of the largest arms suppliers for the digital revolution that we currently have. Mike. I saw some interesting things in 3D printing that American Standard was doing around faucets, basically combining physics and aesthetics, creating their parts and creating an aesthetic feature for the Cub Man. Just saw that last week, and I thought it was very interesting. Wow. What region in the world, other than Detroit, will be the most competitive in manufacturing in five to 10 years? I think Asia. I think there's significant uh, change and significant things coming together with the population explosion. Mark. I think it's a complete jump ball. Uh, we see a lot on the West Coast increasing there. Toss up. All right. If you, my point was it's a huge opportunity. Yeah. The, the entrenched players are not making the investments and they're not aggressively going after the things that they should be doing now. As a result, it's a jump ball. Silicon Valley is asleep to it. Shenzhen is still trying to figure out what it means. Detroit's got an opportunity. Brooklyn's got an opportunity. Milan's got an opportunity. Berlin's got an opportunity. This, it, it's a jump ball. If you were to start a manufacturing company today, what would it manufacture? Raj. It would harness the power of data. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry. Uh, automotive supply, that's where, I'm, where my bread and butter is. I'm manufacturing tech shops. <laughs> <laughs> Mike. Digital automotive supply and manufacturing. Uh, if you had one piece of advice for Detroit to improve its manufacturing future, what would it be? Mike. Embrace change. Mark. Uh, I would in engage the kids, get them in front of a 3D printer and some uh, auto Autodesk's new software. Jerry. That's what I was going to say. Bring the kids in the manufacturing facilities and show them what they can do with their hands. Roger. Digitalization. Please thank our panel. <laughs>